This is the Impact Report. I'm your host, Katie Elman. The Impact Report brings together students and faculty in Bard College's MBA in Sustainability program with leaders in business, sustainability, finance, social entrepreneurship, and more. These conversations go live the first and third Friday of each month. This week, Bard MBA's Erin Seglum speaks with Laura Diaz Munoz, winemaker and general manager of Eller's Estate. Laura Diaz Munoz's winemaking perspective is rooted in the old world, shaped by a broad cross selection of cultures, regions, and vineyard sites. She is driven by her own never ending desire to learn and experiment. In 2011, she created Gallery Wines a brand focused on presenting portraits of place from some of Northern California's most prized Appalachians. Um, Laura joined Ehlers Estate as winemaker and general manager for Ehlers Estate in June of 2018. The Ehlers Estate team prioritizes the preservation of their land and history by embracing organic farming practices. Under Laura's leadership, Ehlers has expanded their sustainability practices in response to a changing climate through the implementation of replanting efforts and the use of biochar, vermilifiltration, filtration, and other methods. Welcome to the Impact Report, Laura. Thanks so much. Thank you. (laughs) Joining us today. Yes. Of course. Um, Well, so we can just jump right in. Um, I would love to hear more about um, Ehlers Estate, and correct me if I'm mispronouncing that as well. Is that Ehlers or Ehlers? No, yes, you pronounce it right. Yes, it's Ehlers Estate. I mean, (laughs) I'm I'm probably not the best person for pronunciation. I obviously have an (laughs) accent. Um, I'm originally from Spain, and I've been been in the U.S. for more than 15 years, but I still have an accent, so... Um, uh, no, anyway, so yes, Ellers Estate um, is a beautiful property. We are located in St. Helena, which is a small town in the northern part of the Napa Valley. Uh, we are in a very unique uh, location. We are uh, in between two mountain ranges in the narrowest point of the valley. Um, uh, for probably some of your audience that are familiar with Napa Valley, there's so many um, appellations uh, in the valley. There's uh, different mountain ranges, um, very huge diversity in a very small valley. And we are located in a very unique uh, place because we uh, have a lot of influence from, from the mountains. And our soils, which are valley floor, and normally you will hear that they are very rich and and very deep and very good for like growing quantities of 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 grapes. Uh, we actually are located in a very shallow um, and very rocky soils, which are very challenging to to farm, um, <laughs> and and especially in the conditions that we're living lately with uh, climate change and warmer temperatures. Yeah, that's really interesting. And how um, how long you, it, it's a historic vineyard. So roughly mm-hmm. how long has it been operating? Yeah, so I mean, it's it's a very old winery. It has a lot of history. Um, it was built, the original building, uh, original winery was built in 1886. So it's one of those early uh, wineries that were built in, in Napa. Um, there's few like Charles Crook or Chateau Montelena that are more known, uh, but this one is a very small one. We have 40 acres of vineyards surrounding the state. Um, and obviously we planted uh, and we have planted Bordeaux varieties, which are the more common varieties that you can find in Napa, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Petit Verdot, and Sauvignon Blanc. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned uh, the microclimate and that kind of impacting the soil. Does it mean that you're growing kind of a variety of uh, some varietals that you don't see in other parts of the Napa Valley? Mm, not really. I mean, um, these are varieties that have been very well established here and for, mm. uh, you know, the time that has we in Napa Valley, we have grown um, uh, vines. It's they are very well established varietals. So we could actually play around with other varieties, but um, they do very well. Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, they adapt very well to cooler mm-hmm. or warmer uh, climates. Um, 
they are very well established and just because we have been farming organically for um, more than 10 years, um, no more than more than 20 years we've been farming organically. Um, they are very well established. We have very good mesoclimate uh, in the surrounding the, the vineyards and, and they're doing very well. We just have to change or adapt certain of the practices that we are doing on, on a yearly basis based on how vintage is and how the season is coming or or is behaving, we change some of our farming practices to adapt to those to those uh, conditions, the climate conditions. Yeah, absolutely. And have you all seen a change in climate conditions in the last <clears throat> ten to fifteen years? I know you've only been there since twenty eighteen. But... <laughs> yes, I mean, <laughs> even even before being an Ellers, uh, yes, we have experienced vintages that have been more challenging. Uh, especially, for example, last year, 2022, uh, was very challenging because we have heat events during the growing season that were affecting the vineyards um, very radically. We had high temperatures not only during the day, but also during the night. So the vines didn't have a break. Um, and, and it was very challenging for a winemaker to react very quickly and to take decisions where it was not, it's not what we were expecting. Um, mm -hmm. So we are trying to adapt and here at Ellers Estate, most of the decisions that I'm taking uh, in the short time that I've been here is just being sure that we are um, managing these vineyards so they can stay around for 30 to 40 more years planted here. Um, as you mentioned, I'm doing some replanting. So I'm doing a lot of a study about how to manage raw orientation, how to manage canopy to create a really good microclimate uh, around the cluster area. So we can actually produce um, fruit that uh, is not too concentrated in sugar, that it retains good acidity and retains good aromas and flavors. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do as farmers to, to mm -hmm. manage this situation, but um, uh, I think it's in everybody's hands to change um, uh, climate change, yeah. To, yeah, to, to fight against climate change. So it's we're doing what we can. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, and you know, I think sustainability is one of those words. It's a very big word that means different things depending on the industry that you're in and the type of work that you're doing. So when you think about sustainability and the role it plays in the wine industry and for ailers, what do you think about? Well, I I try to think about um every single action that we take. Uh, every single practice that we implement, yeah, yeah, whether it's in, in the cellar or it's in the vineyards or it's even in the offices or just how we manage uh, people, I, what is more efficient, what is less impactful, uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's how I take it. That's for me sustainability is like I try to take as much as I'm giving, basically, it is how to uh, create a um, a neutral, um, we can call it economy or neutral impact. Um, that's that's what I'm trying to achieve. So we we obviously we are organic, but we're implementing, for example, uh, a system in in the in the cellar where we are gonna all we're gonna treat all the processed water and through a system that is called biofiltro and which is basically based on worms that I'm going to digest that water and we're going to be able to reuse that water for irrigation of the vineyards or irrigation of landscaping. Um, that is one, one action that we are taking. Um, also, we are thinking very carefully about how many passes with tractors we do. Uh, any equipment that we buy is actually an equipment that is going to save energy, that is, is efficient. Um, mm -hmm. we, do we really need it? So it's every single decision that we take uh, on a daily basis. I try to think is if it's actually um, sustainable. Yeah. So it sounds like sustainability has kind of been embedded in your decision making processes, which is basically yes. And, yeah. and, and there's, <laughs> there's there's also a lot of uh, it's very important also from the point of view of economical sustainability, because obviously nowadays uh, we are suffering, especially wine industry, but um, many industries, they are suffering about really high pricing, uh, there are a lot of issues with sipping. Um, we obviously have problems with glass, uh, the bottles mm -hmm. that we use for, for wine. They're very heavy. Mm -hmm. 
um, yeah. they are very costly. It's like how how can we manage um, every single aspect uh, on a bottle of wine that that can be more efficient? And that's is very important, mm -hmm. and especially economically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think the glass one is a really great example. That's a that's a challenge that I think you know food and other industries are trying to solve at the same time. So. Um, I, uh, in terms of some of the strategies that you've implemented, you've already talked about several, um, but I'm curious if you've uh, seen, what have you, I'm curious what you've learned um, from those strategies and when you've, you know, the implementation of them, have any of them gone remarkably well and surprised you or have any kind of been something that felt big, but wound up not being as fruitful? Um, I think um, there's, there's a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, I will say, not lack of knowledge, but um, we are trying a lot of things that are a little bit blindly. Like we don't, we we don't know what is going to be the outcome, and we just try because the theory tells us that, or the science tells us that it's going to be right. But in in particularly with farming, um, every single site is different, and when it works for one winery and wine uh, and a vineyard, doesn't work for another one. And it's because we different sites uh, have different uh, disease pressure, for example, or they are um, they have different climates, and that that is the beauty of wine, and this is the beauty of terroir, and that's what make every single bottle of wine, even if it comes from Napa, different. Um, mm -hmm. But um, everybody is dealing with different challenges. Um, in my case here. We're just dealing with very rocky soils, um, soils that are, have very good drainage and they are hard to retain the water and the irrigation mm -hmm. that we give them, even if we have plenty of water. Um, other sites, for example, they are cooler, they, they suffer from frost. And this is something that climate change has brought, uh, more events of hail and frost that are damaging uh, the vines. Um, and that is, you know, they, they have to deal with a different problem. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I'm, I'm learning, that it's more of a trial and error uh, situation. We are trying things that we think that are going to be right, but sometimes they don't work. And most of the time they work, but we just need yeah. to, to learn um, more about what we are doing and why we are doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, given that you are in Napa Valley and there's such a concentration of winemakers there, do you have the chance to connect with um, peers in the mm -hmm. area? Yeah, there's always um, uh, professional groups, and um, and and we're very connected. And winemakers, yeah, we we use friends and and colleagues. And whenever we have an issue, obviously, you know, there was some critical situations. For example, when we had the fires recently in 2020, which um, affected affected all of us. And it's a global problem because you know fires are happening in Spain, in Australia, in Chile recently. Um, they were suffering from 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 events that are damaging um, the wine the wines and, and and the vineyards. So it's it's very it's very interesting how the industry all came along and just work together towards a problem and help each other and give advice of what we can do. Um, it's a very s a small industry, I will say. Even you know, and now because of internet and you know social media, we are all connected. We know what is happening in the other side of the wall and. And what they are they are experiencing is probably that everybody else is going to experience it in in some point. So, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'd love to shift gears a little bit and just hear um, a little bit more about your role um, at uh, at Ailers, um, and specifically, you know, obviously, women in winemaking is still relatively small from a representation standpoint, um, particularly in leadership roles. So I'm curious, kind of as you've grown your career, um, what have you learned about being a woman in the winemaking industry? Oof, what, I, what I learned about that topic, I think, I mean, I yes. think we are still a minority in almost every industry and business yeah. uh, in the world. So uh, what I'm learning is that we're still very behind. Um, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, we are very far from where we should be um, on an equal point of view, just treated professionally and economically. And um, I mean, we're just working towards it. And um, I, I, I just feel that there's still a lot of work to do. Um, we're just scratching the surface and we're just like 
getting a little bit of attention. Um, I'm that kind of person that I think that is not helping to talk too much about, oh, I'm a female winemaker. But that is a reality that, you know, we have to deal with. Like people wants to know, it's like, oh, you are a woman and you are in this in this industry that it seems very hard from, from outside. But I, I know that every single industry is, is experiencing the same um, with female winemakers or, 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 or sorry, with female uh, professionals or female um, or even just someone that is different, not just not just female or women. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit more about how you got into the winemaking business. I know you've been in it for quite a long time. Um, so uh, if you wouldn't mind giving me a, a short kind of background on on where you started in Spain um, and then kind of how you made your way to Napa. Of course, yeah. So. I mean, it's 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 a very simple story, but uh, I don't know. It's just like um, I always love wine. I, I I always say this since the first time that I sip and try a little bit of wine, I always serve at the table at home. Um, obviously, I'm from Spain, and um, all the consumption of wine in Spain is is dropping. <laughs> Back in the days, we always had wine uh, at the table for every single meal uh, at as, at home and for different events. And you know, Spain uh, is a very outdoor uh, kind of like uh, quality of life. We like to be outdoors. We will like to go out. And so I I grew up with um, my father who served wine with me since I was very little. There's always like, mm-hmm. let's try. And um, I love food. Um, I was very close with my, my grandma and my mom. They cook. So I was always cooking with them. And all my background, just because I was interested in science since very little, uh, I studied biology and I studied food and science technology. I actually mm-hmm. was more interested in food than in wine uh, back in the day. But um, last year in university, I had to do an internship on a food and beverage company. And there were a few wineries offering an a internship. And I just raised my hand and I, because <laughs> I was like, oh, I like wine. I, this seems interesting. So why not? Uh, and that was just like a two weeks internship. And um and I just fell in love with it. I just fell with in love with the aromas and the action that it was happening in the cellar and just walking the vineyards. And there was like so many things going on. There was science, chemistry in the wine, but there's also a lot of farming and all the viticulture uh, part of it. It's, I thought it was super interesting. Um, so I, I went back and studied uh, a master in viticulture and enology uh, in the university. And um, from there, I just started working here and there in a few harvests, um, landed a job uh, with one, a winery that is, is very popular in Spain, González Vallas, and, um, and I had the opportunity to work with very interesting uh, winemakers um, that gave me lots of, of opportunities to grow, and um, I decided to travel around the world. There's a lot of winemakers that that's how they learn, just by doing harvest uh, in different countries. Um, mm-hmm. And um, that's how I, I I traveled to New Zealand. I did a harvest there. And then uh, from there, I decided to come to California, just thinking that I was going to spend two or three months. And then my plan was to move to Argentina because I love Malbec. <laughs> ah. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, I got I got offered a job and, and I stay here. So, yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Well, I will say my uh, the first time that I really ever tried or enjoyed wine was in Spain. Um, I did not have access to it growing up, but I went to um, Sevilla and it was very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I am curious about some of the trends that you've seen throughout your career and, you know, shifting. And I know we're just about at time, but um have you seen changes in diversity or kind of in how labor is managed? I know that's, you know, I mean, like any other industry, there's always risks around human rights and labor. So is that Mm -hmm. a conversation you've seen shift um, in your time? I mean, definitely here in California. Yes. Uh, There's obviously a huge concern about labor. And um, I was always, I was always very presently surprised of how, important was here, especially in California, to treat right to employees and, you know, take care of them. Safety is, is number one priority in 
in any winery. Um, so yeah, but one one of the things and I will say like trends that I, I'm seeing is like there's more transparency about what we're doing. There's more transparency about salaries. There's more transparency about practices. Um, and I think that is thanks to, you know, internet communication now is better. Consumers are more educated. They know and they want to know what is in, in, in what they are eating or what they are drinking. Um, there's more transparency and labels and probably hopefully soon we're going to include ingredients in, in a bottle of wine, which I think is super beneficial for everybody to know what they're drinking. Um, mm -hmm. So I, 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 I'm seeing all of this and I think it's all just because we are in a global um, industry and I think, you know, just we are all connected. I think with pandemic, we realize how connected we are. The whole entire world, we are all connected, every single country. And if if someone does well, everybody else is going to do well and vice versa, you know? So I think that's what I'm seeing. And I, I it, there's a lot of exchange of good practices and good ideas. And I think it's very, very beneficial. That's awesome. Well, and on that note, I'm curious if there's anything um, looking ahead with the wine industry that you find particularly exciting about its growth and evolution. Yes. Well, one of the things that I, I feel very excited and it's happening, I think, everywhere in the world, there's more interest about experimenting, about planting new varieties, about being less tied to regulations. Um, it's happening in Spain and it's happening in France. It's happening everywhere. Um, here, I think uh, in the US, I've seen more wine regions coming up and making good wines. Um, there's more interest about planting new varieties that are not just like the traditional ones. And I'm seeing that consumers are interested on in getting to know more about, about it and they're more open to try new things. So um, I'm very excited about it. Um, hopefully we will be seeing new wines coming from California and from Napa uh, that are not expected, but it's all about making good wines and and enjoying them. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, well, any final thoughts? Uh, where can folks learn more about Ehlers Estate um, and the wine that y'all produce? Yeah, so I mean, I hope that uh, your listeners can visit and because it's very important to see it in person. It just makes sense. Uh, we have a beautiful garden. Uh, it's a um, um, uh, drought tolerant garden, beautiful olive grove. The vineyards are gorgeous and I, I have an amazing staff uh, happy to to host and they are very educated so um, don't be afraid if you don't know much about wine it's the best way to know it's just visiting a vineyard yeah absolutely I've seen photos and it's gorgeous so <laughs> <laughs> I will hopefully make my day my way out there one day um, but yeah again thank you Laura for your time and uh, your answers it's been great to uh, chat with you thank you thank you very much yes We appreciate our loyal Impact Report listeners and hope you can help us spread the word about the series and the important sustainability work of our guests. Please rate and review the Impact Report wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you were inspired by this conversation, share a screenshot on Instagram and tag Impact Report Podcast. For a full list of Ellers Estates wines, their history, and more about their sustainability efforts, visit ellersestate.com slash vineyards. Join us for the next episode of the Impact Report on Friday, May 26th. We'll be speaking with Renee Graham of Renzo Box. Interested in learning how you can launch a high-impact, purpose-driven career in sustainability? Check out the resources page from the Bard Graduate Programs in Sustainability for access to free resources to jumpstart your career. Hear from leaders in the fields of climate change, consulting, impact finance, circular economy, and more about how they launch their careers and the tips they have for you to join their industries. Visit gps.bard.edu resources today.